thank you and thank you everybody for being here. I prepared a presentation for you that has to do with my training and my past as a humanist and my experience collaborating with other humanists, which has not always been a very efficient or convenient collaboration, at least not as much as it should be. So when I was invited to participate in Wikimania, I thought, well, what would be the most appropriate reflection to share in such an environment? Because if there's something that has taught us about collaboration and about the meaning of collaborating in our new technological era, it's precisely Wikipedia. I have been, I must confess, a very cowardly uh, Wikipedian because I don't edit very often, because I get very worked up about the potential reactions of other Wikipedians, and so I always walk on eggshells. I really kind of try to to be very careful to avoid offending others, which is the opposite of what I do in the academic world, where I really am out to offend anybody that I can offend. But of course, the reflection that I want to share with you is what is the deep reason why humanists don't collaborate on the one hand, and then on the other hand, I'd also like to discuss what we can do, how we can move forward establishing basic agreements within the humanist community to be able to collaborate better. But I'd like to begin by giving a definition. I don't think my clicker is working. There it is. Two definitions. The first definition is, what is a humanist? And I'll just say that a humanist is an individual who works within humanities. What I want you to understand with this definition is to keep you from falling in the confusion that many political and cultural currents sometimes make that present themselves as humanists, and then it becomes very difficult to distinguish what they are. For instance, the right-wing party here, the National Action Party, defines itself as a humanist party because there's a Catholic conservative humanist movement, and I don't want you to think that that is what I'm talking about. It is absolutely unrelated. When I talk about being a humanist, it is an individual who has studied about humanities. And what are humanities? What are the disciplines? included in humanities. Here in Mexico, we include language, literature, philosophy, religion, history, that sometimes in other countries falls under the scope of social sciences. Here in Mexico, we consider it a humanity. Then pedagogy, which also in other countries of the world is seen independently as a different area of study. Here, we also connect it to humanism. Then classical studies like law and linguistics. I don't think anybody really knows what linguistics does and what people in linguistics do or where to classify them. But here in Mexico, we consider them humanists. But how or what do we consider this tradition of humanists that can be very well represented by this painting, this very famous romantic pa painting of Manfred? It's the first picture that I have on my presentation. It's also another image. The first one you saw was also of Manfred, a romantic hero, always represented up in solitude, out in the mountains, just in, in self-reflection, thinking about life and the cosmos and death, knowledge. But how do we, how did we get to that? How did we find that image of the humanist? I always like to blame Descartes, of course. Like, everything is Descartes' fault. Nietzsche used to think that everything was Socrates' fault, but I think it's Descartes that we should be blaming. And then, well, probably nowadays we could also call it Nietzsche's fault. But what Descartes said in his introduction to the method discourse, he has a text. It's somewhat lengthy, and you might not be able to read it from where you're sitting, but it's a text that defines the humanist tradition very clearly. Basically, and I'll just sum it up for you, what Descartes claimed was that we must 
be very mistrustful of works created by many hands because the only people that we can trust and the only thing that we can consider certain is when you do something yourself. So when you work in isolation, to have the presence of an oven is very important. Be alone with an oven in front of you where there is absolutely nothing to distract you. There's no, no desire, there's nothing. And when you're sitting in that environment, or when he was sitting in that environment, he came to the con conclusion that the science of books, at least those whose reasons are not very tangible and have nothing to demonstrate, gathering the opinions of others will not bring you closer to the truth, but rather your own individual reasoning will probably bring you closer to the truth, just reasoning about whatever comes across whatever comes in front of you. But we, as men, have, of course, been driven by our appetites and our precepts that often have been contradictory and mutually exclusive and sometimes didn't really give us the best options. And so it's almost impossible to make our judgments as pure, as perfect as they could have been if, at the moment when we were born, we would have 100% uh, use of our logic and reason, and we had never been polluted by our environment. So to Descartes, everybody's problem is that we're alive. So it's very much like when you talk about football, soccer, like everybody has an opinion, everybody has something to say about what needs to be done, but the result always is, as we see in our national football team, a disaster. So Descartes offers as an alternative thought that logic and reason Reason is the only answer to face any problem ahead of us. So in saying that, Descartes already created a profile for the humanist. And if I can move on to the next slide, I can show you what that profile is. This profile tells us that humanities must always follow a critical speculative method associated to reflection in solitude. And this is something that we owe to religion. This is a concept that, you know, if you want to think about the times of St. Augustine or St. Geronimus, he always, you see him in the picture of writing alone with nothing but a skull, just to have that thought that the thinker is someone who is always alone, someone who is in solitude, someone who is deep, deep in self-reflection and that lonely or solitary reflection I think is something that we owe to religion but being a humanist is also introspection it is facing your own self a humanist must always be aware of anything that is coming to his mind and if those things that are coming to mind where do they come from where are they rooted if, as Descartes said, that if we were given, the moment when we were born, a load of opinions and a load of ideas, then we're always thinking, or we should always be thinking, about whether these ideas that we have learned and acquired from others are valid or not. And that means sometimes a confrontation, identifying your own mistakes, knowing when you're, when you're not doing something right. And then this takes us to Descartes, and this brief summary that I gave you, which was uh, part of a reflection of Pedro Stepanenko, was that we must be and we are accountable for our own beliefs. We cannot take refuge in the fact that someone else said, someone else thought, no, I thought and I decided to accept what someone else said, but it is always on me. What I mean is that the humanist seeks autonomy, independence, and that is theoretically connected to an authentic life, a genuine life, the fact that I lead my own life according to my own rational principles, and I don't just obey the commands of others. This is something that would take Nietzsche away from the crowd and would take him to enlightenment. This image of the humanist that we have, where his personal reflection should take him to autonomy. As we had said with Descartes, it is a life free of 
tutors, teachers, free of trends, free of beliefs given by others. Everybody needs to get into the game of free thinking, allowing these ideas to flow freely but always making sure that they are your own ideas. What matters here, and I really want us to realize this and understand, is that each and every one of these ideas seek to define a profile. And what we can identify is that the humanist is someone living in solitude. If they respect the premise that they must think independently, then they must think in solitude away from others. This gives us, as a result, that the product of humanities are always personal works, deeply personal works, whether they're books, articles, papers, conferences, and something that we must highlight, because this has always been an obstacle in the life of a humanist, is, of course, trying to get away from being a show-off or being pedantic. That's something that has always been associated with humanists. I will always consider my opinion better than yours. I will always believe that I'm smarter than you, that I know better, that, you know, Descartes is mine, and I've read it, and no one understood it as well as I did. That is always seen as the greatest shortcoming of humanists. And it is seen in the way humanists discuss, argue, and defend their own opinions. Now let's look at how this lack of collaboration is seen in humanists in comparison to other groups. This is a study that was held in Canada in 2006, where they compared the research papers published collaborative research papers found in hard sciences, which is, of course, where we find the greatest number, and then the social sciences, which we can see in the middle of that graph, and finally humanities, which is that straight line on the bottom of the graph. So humanists, as we can see here, simply don't collaborate. We must also say that overall, the assessment criteria for humanists include being able to say that the humanist work has to be individual and independent. That is to say, it is doesn't only show that we're self-centered and self-involved and whatever, pedantic and everything that we have already said, but it also responds to a reality that that culture has permeated the assessment systems, the the knowledge building systems, the institutional systems of humanist work, and that is what we can see in the graph. Scientists collaborate. They collaborate 80% of the time, when humanists only collaborate 10% of the time. And this is not only true in Canada, of course. This is something that we can see all around the world. Perhaps the only thing worth saying, worth adding, is how in the realm of humanities, Eastern countries, Korea, China, etc., have a higher degree of collaboration than the Western world. But at the end of the day, as you can see, practically every country has very low rates of collaboration. So this really is a very deep problem for humanists. And if we think about a whole system to generate knowledge, as is the case of Wikipedia, this is one of the main obstacles both for its acceptance and for content generation. Because the encyclopedia as a product is by definition, and very broadly of course, a, a humanist work. Coming from the definition of the Age of Enlightenment, it characterizes the humanistic efforts of, of growth of knowledge that comes from the Age of Enlightenment. And nowadays, it seems to be that we, the humanists, are the ones that are keeping this from growing. My experience working with Wikipedia in the classroom and encouraging the use of Wikipedia in the classroom, encouraging students to use Wikipedia in the classroom as a source of information, using it myself as a source of information. Of course, besides the fact that I'm friends with most Wikipedians in Mexico, I do it because it's a good example of something that is happening that has an effect on humanities and that has a deep impact on humanities because 
And I know that this is, is, all of you know everything that has been criticized about the Wikipedia, the fact that there is no single author identified that anybody can write and collaborate and that the products are collaborative where the responsibility is diluted and it's probably wrong. No, I, I can name them, but I think we've all heard them before, these arguments. And I am convinced that these are coming from the world of humanities because this is a model that is entirely different to the traditional way of working in the world of humanities. Okay, I think that I've made myself clear so far, and my main point is that humanists shy away from collaboration. Now, we're at a time when the appearance of technologies based on collaboration, technologies that encourage collaboration, technologies that are thought out to seek collaboration, and that not only that, but the culture where these tools have been born is a culture based on collaboration. So humanists often are standing here facing a world that is yelling at us to collaborate and we're just resisting. So what can be done? The first thing that can be done is learn the definition of collaboration. What does it mean to collaborate? And I want to share three different definitions with you. I got to say that I chose the English definition of Wikipedia because the Spanish entry for collaboration, I think, leaves a lot to be desired. I think that's something that we really need to be working on. But basically, all three definitions highlight the importance of working with others. However, and I decided to leave the definition from the Wikipedia English entry of collaboration, what the Wikipedia definition adds is that besides working with others, you have to see a positive aspect of that, the rewarding sense of working with others. Because if you look at the definition of the RAE, the Royal Academy of Spanish Language, which is a free dictionary, what we get in that definition is no benefit. It only says that it's about working with others. But the English definition tells us that collaboration has a series of benefits, that it leads to recognition that it allows us to make better use of our resources when resources are not that great. And this is important because if we truly want to think about collaboration, we must think that collaboration is positive and that it has a series of variables and principles that make it positive. But before getting there, let's stop for a minute and think about what collaboration demands above all else. And what collaboration demands above anything else is trusting someone else. Meaning this could not be performed by humanists at all, like hanging there depending on someone else to ho hold on to you. Because trusting others and trusting in others' opinions seems to be outside of our genetic composition as humanists, we don't trust others. Anybody who has worked with a humanist has you know, probably had experience in this. You know that we are naturally mistrustful. If you did something for us, we probably double check, triple check to make sure that you didn't mess it up. And we all went to high school. We all had a history teacher, a philosophy teacher, a literature teacher. Those are horrible. and. They're always sort of inviting us not to trust others. So collaboration is a major change in the humanist ethics, in the humanist ethos. It's not only a change in terms of acquiring new habits or new practices, which is something that can be learned with relative ease, but it's a change at the core. It's a change of our ethos. It's giving up that idea of autonomy that is so deeply rooted, leaving that behind and follow a new ethics of trust in others' ideas. How can we make this transition? Because it's not easy. It is not easy at all to make this shift, this transformation in our humanist work ethics 
And we can go beyond that even, not only for humanists, for anybody who seeks to collaborate, it will, they will be facing the same obstacles because collaboration implies, as Julia Flanders says, making many more concessions than we usually would in the social contract. That is, in our human social relationships, we tend to accept the participation of others. But collaboration implies going beyond that which we are naturally prone to accept. Because what we will be doing is make ourselves be subjected to new rules of collaboration that limit our freedom even more. Think about when you are editing an entry in Wikipedia, an article, or when you are about to present a work to the opinion of others, to the scrutiny of others, and not only an opinion that you will be sharing, but an opinion that will actually have an impact on the work that you're about to publish. I don't know. If you don't want to take the example of the Wikipedia, then maybe think about a submission to a newspaper. You have to face the scrutiny of an editor, and an editor who is much like the editor of the newspaper in Spider-Man, right? It's someone who doesn't like you very much, and therefore will be crossing out everything you write. This is wrong, this is wrong, do this again. When you have to face that, meaning a person who will be editing that is a person in authority, then our freedom is limited because the power that this other person has is literally a power of action, of, of doing something to our work. And so our freedom is constrained. When this first happens to you, it feels horrible. It is very hard to take it. It's like, oh, because we also tend to get confused. We humanists, we are proud, or writers, for instance, let's not go beyond that. Writers always feel proud of our final work, of what we write, of our product. So if someone just, you know, sits there with a pen crossing out the first paragraph, mm, this doesn't work, this has to go, ah, I hate your word choice, mm, this lacks references. We feel that the work, the text that is coming under attack is not really being under attack, but it is actually we who are under attack. We take it personal, and that's why it's not easy. That's why it is difficult to collaborate. But beyond that, the problem is, and this is the second problem, that those norms, these rules that we are bound by must be self-created. We have to generate them. We have to come up with them. And then we have to adapt because they're not given. Well, some, as we will see, are already given to us. For instance, when we do institutional work, when our collaboration is within an organization like a university, then there are a series of guidelines and rules that are already predetermined for us and that we must respect, meaning we don't always get to make them up. But there are others which we do. These are five principles to create those rules and to move forward towards collaboration. Rule number one is changing the way in which we communicate and interact. That is, say goodbye to pedantry. It is better to speak in a matter-of-fact way. It is better to be clear and concise than look for wordiness and confusing language. For instance, a nuance uh, that I really have considered interesting is that in Mexico, we always talk about opening a discussion. But the term discussion always sounds aggressive. It sounds like we're about to fight. No, Discussing is just make is seeing who can say things louder, who can be more emphatic, who can fight harder. And I have a son who's a specialist in that, like emphasizing his words very much just to win an argument over. But in the Anglo-Saxon world, in the English-speaking world, when you use the word discussion, 
we we mean conversation what we open is a conversation a dialogue and in that dialogue what we try to do is not fight but moderate so think about the words that we use to our word choice can often make a very stark distinction to help us understand collaboration as teamwork or as a war that someone is bound to win. I think that what matters is to follow the first avenue, that is, seeking an agreement and not a fight. Of course, this also means overcoming obstacles like territory. We have to stop thinking, this is my topic, this is my thing. There are people in the world of humanities who believe that topics belong to them and no one else should have a say in them. So if I was the first one who started working with Thomas de Quincey, for instance, that's something that happened to me, no one else can write about Thomas de Quincey because why? Why? What authority does this person have? So we cannot be territorial. Our topics are not our territory. Our subjects of discussion are not our territory. Topics are spaces for agreement. Now, the third rule is being able to create negotiation rules, establishing protocols, establishing an etiquette for collaborative work. I like that word, etiquette, and I like it because it talks about politeness and good manners in order to do things, and I think this is a problem that Wikipedia itself has because we don't always find good manners. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But that's something that we must develop. How can we have those rules of negotiating? How can we say no to someone else? Or how can we suggest to someone else that we have a better option that could lead to an improvement without that being seen as a confrontation or, or without that leading to a confrontation. So how could be those protocols, what could be those norms of etiquette that would enable us to collaborate in a healthy manner? Then step four, rule four would be, step five, sorry, would be overcoming our prejudice. We all have prejudice. We all believe that depending on people's background and how they dress and the language that they use, we can make a judgment on how valuable their contributions are or not. But we must be able to leave behind all of that prejudice if we truly want to collaborate, collaborating doesn't have to do with how the other person looks or how the other person speaks or who that person is in general. It has to do with our ability to reach agreements to get something that is bigger than the both of us, that is bigger than the qualities that we both bring into the picture. And of course, we have to learn new languages. And I don't only mean that we have to speak other languages from other countries. What I mean is that we must learn the language of design. We must learn the language of software creators, of, of computer techs. We must learn to master, or if not master, then at least learn to understand how others think to be able to collaborate. We cannot collaborate with my friends that are in computing linguistics. That has been a problem. When do you stop serving others and actually reach collaboration? What I mean is, when do you come up to someone and say, I'd like to come up with a website, and then the other person just, you know, serves you and creates that as a service to you, but never really asks you what you want it for. He makes no suggestions. There is no input. That means that this person has not stepped into your shoes to understand what you want, and that you then, in turn, also don't have the ability to step into his shoes and understand how he thinks. So our acquisition of new languages, you know, humanists in the past used to believe that we needed to learn just foreign languages, but now we need to learn to program. We now need to learn how frameworks are created or understand basic uh, 
aspects of design in order to be able to do a lot of what we want to do. If we can overcome all of these obstacles, then we must not forget a series of principles that we will be facing. Collaboration takes place in a place where there is a convergence of different environments, not only the expectations of individuals. When we work together, everyone that participates in this collaboration have ideas, feelings, desires around this collaboration. And also, collaboration, as collaboration goes on, there are some local issues, for instance, when we try to work with academia or some professional issues when we try to work within a guild and, of course, social issues when we try to escalate collaboration to another level. We want to wonder or see if societies really foster collaboration and which societies um, imp impede that because collaboration, some societies really encourage collaboration, some others do not. And at some point in Mexico, we've always say that this is a very a place where there's a lot of solidarity and the question should be if this solidarity could turn into collaboration or not, whether they are the same or not, and when you move from one condition to the other for just from just solidarity to collaboration. And of course, we need to be aware that any type of collaboration is subject to a regime, and that we need to be aware of that. Collaboration is, just to give you an example, it is subject to a language. What if we collaborate in Spanish, English, Italian, or French, or whether we use two, three languages, this is a, a, a framework. This is something that includes some things and excludes some other things. And the same happens in the case for humanities in translation. In translation, you do not, when you do not collaborate, what are your structures? What are the things that allow you to collaborate? So, underlining collaboration, and I'm thinking here on academic collaboration, but collaboration is broader than that, and you need to find the common language, and above all, to be able to share. Because if you do not share that, if you do not, if you just keep what you know for yourself, then there should not, there should not be any possibility for collaboration. If I go beyond a phase uh, or a level on a, on a video game, but I cannot share that knowledge, then there is no possibility of collaboration and of learning. So I'm lagging behind. That's my bad. And of course, the more the disciplines there are two final things. Collaboration needs a lot of effort, so the more disi disciplines, the more, the greater the effort. So the working groups are really big that involve people with really many sp specialties. They need, they require a lot of effort. We cannot think that collaboration is easy. Collaboration requires effort and requires also patience. Collaboration and development of practices for collaboration require time and they should mature. This is something that is not produced automatically. This part of th the learning process of being a Wikipedian is to, in order to develop a relationship with other Wikipedian, it requires time, understanding, uh, valuing, appreciating. So in order to have a collaborate, collaborative relationship. It's just like a, a marriage. It's a long-term relationship, and you always have to think in the long term. Of course, and that, that's the promise, collaboration brings benefits, or at least the idea is to have, uh, the idea is to think that collaboration is good, and I will uh, take this post from Laura McCrath, she's a student in the humanities, digital humanities. We are humanists that use m computer instruments and devices to resolve problems in humanities. This is a student that 
had this humanist uh, mission and she thought that she preferred the solitude of her own room to do her own e essays, uh, essays. And so this post reveals three things. To collaborate always means to get naked, to show your nudity. It shows your processes, how you work, what you think, and of course, and therefore, if that will help you to collaborate, if that makes you a good team work person. And if you're a good person, if you know how to collaborate, then you need to improve your skills because collaboration does not only have collaboration as a final product, but the improvement of your own abilities, your own skills. So if you've never written a book and you participate in the making of a book, you will learn things that you never that you didn't know. And maybe perhaps this is the strongest best when you when you show your nudity, you show who you really are as a peer, as a partner, as a colleague, and how much can you be trusted, how many trust can you earn. And those are the benefits of collaborations, but there are other benefits for the projects. Those benefits are three. Projects in collaboration always get more resources because the more the people get involved, the possibility to obtaining resources is broader. You get more attention and they are sustainable. So at the end, projects, individual projects are more weak in general terms, especially in a society like our society, whereas projects in collaboration have the benefit of being a lot more in terms of long-term survival, a lot broader. So with this, I will end my presentation. These are the sources for my presentation. This is the what I used to prepare all of these. And I thank you for your time.